and that's the wrong approach. <clears throat> so we're here to say there is a right approach. And when you look at our basic precepts, as we were rolling out the medical record, we had two learnings. One of them is all, all, and all, which means all of the data, but all of the patients, all of the time. Patient-focused data, patient-centered data, not billing process-centered data, patient-focused data that's about the patient and all of the data and available real time because you need it now. You need it in the moment of care delivery. You need it as you're taking care of the patient. So all of the data, all of the time is the first precept. And the second one, and this is fundamental to understanding Kaiser Permanente. If you're trying to figure out who we are and what we do and how we succeed, making the right thing easy to do is the motto of the Care Management Institute, or the, the guideline it has been for a very long time. Make the right thing easy to do is extremely important because if the right thing is hard to do, it will not happen. And if the wrong thing is easy to do, the wrong thing will happen. And so what we need to do is make the right thing easy to do, and that has, and, and this is actually extremely important as you're figuring out how to go forward in almost any agenda, but particularly in the computer world, making the right thing easy to do is important, and that has two parts to it, and they are very important parts. The first one is to figure out the right thing. And the second is to make it easy to do. And figuring out the right thing is a significant undertaking. And if you sit down and figure out what is the right thing to do for these patients, what am I going to do with kids with asthma? What am I going to do with people whose bones are breaking? But if you figure out what do you want to do, what's the right thing, and then you figure out how to make it easy to do, make it easy for the caregivers, make it easy for the patient. If you use that as a basic philosophy of going forward, the right thing is likely to happen, and it's likely to happen in volume. And as we've looked at the opportunities that exist, we've concluded that the sweet spot for care improvement is patient-focused, data-supported team care. Team care is extremely important, and I'm going to keep saying that. Teams are the true care improvement magic. America needs care teams. American care is siloed right now. It's splintered. It, it's sitting and the, the, the various specialists don't communicate with the other specialists. Uh, I've, I've got a, a good friend in, in uh, Phoenix who just had to get her attorney to go to seven different doctor's offices where she's been getting care for the last year to get each of the pieces of paper together so they can take it to another doctor and, and go through the kinds of learning that they need to go through about her care. Um, they desperately needs team care. Chronic care is very much a team sport. So American health care reform needs to achieve those goals, it needs to achieve coverage, cover everyone. We need care improvement, we need cost improvement, and we need health improvement. And each of the stages is needed. They need to be simultaneous, but they also need to be segregated. We can't blend them, we have to link them. They have to be sequential as well as linked. And care and coverage improvement need to precede cost improvement. Some people, a lot of people kept saying, why don't we start the health care reform bill by focusing on cost? Why don't we do cost first and then deal with the rest of the stuff later? And everybody in this room knows why that is a really bad idea. If you start with cost first, the only easily available tool is to ration. Ration is the wrong approach. It's the wrong tool. It's the wrong direction. It's the wrong strategy. If we get everybody covered, and we fix care, then we can make care more affordable, and we don't do it by rationing. Rationing is a wrong approach. So why do we need to fix care to make it affordable? We know right now that we're not doing a good job on major areas of care. We know for kids with asthma, we're only getting care right 47% of the time as a country. We know for people with diabetes, we're only getting the right package of care 8% of the time. For kids with diabetes, um, we need those kids to have coverage so that they can have care plans so that they can receive care and have it paid for. And if we have the right care plans for those kids, we can get the number of kids up from 47 percent to 97 percent and cut asthma attacks in half. And today for those kids for the country, we have no data. We don't know which 47 percent are getting the right care. We have no tools. We can't connect the hospital with the 
pediatrician so that the pediatrician knows that the kid had an asthma attack and is in a crisis position. We have too many kids with no coverage or interrupted coverage, and so there's no data flow. So you can track the data over time to know what happened to that kid last year, two years ago, and three years ago. So we need coverage. We need all kids to have coverage, and the law, the new law is working in that direction, and it will achieve that. And coverage is job one, and that's particularly important because we have 59 million uninsured people in America. The number has gone up. And we spend twice as much money as everybody else, and I'm going to come back and talk about that. Twice as much money as everybody else, and 59 million people. We're the only country in the world where you can have a health condition that destroys you economically. The rest of the countries have the health condition itself will not destroy you economically. So we need the coverage reform. Coverage reform has four stages as well, and I'm going to cover them very, very quickly. But these are extremely important reforms. If you look at health care reform, the bill that just passed, we need guaranteed issue. We need everybody who really needs insurance to be able to buy insurance. A friend of mine just called me up from another state who said, I've just been diagnosed as having congestive heart failure. I've lost my job. I have my savings. I have my house. I don't want to lose my house and my savings because of congestive heart failure. I can't get insurance. What in the world do I do? And I said, the new law that was just passed created high-risk pools. You can now get in. You can, as of right now, that safety net is in place. Uh, guess what? You're, you're not going to lose your house because you can get that coverage. So guaranteed issue is an extremely important part of the reform package. It kicks in big time in 2014, but it kicks in now. The safety net expansion, having every poor person in America with Medicaid is really, really important, long overdue. We should have been covering poor people long ago. We'll finally be covering them. Subsidized coverage for low-income people is extremely important. The working poor need subsidies for their health premium. The new law provides those. And the new law creates exchanges, insurance exchanges, with subsidies built in so that people can make meaningful choices about the right coverage, the right care. And if they do the exchanges right, they can be very, very powerful mechanisms for improving the market. So the law has in it a template that can get us to where we need to get. There's a lot of rhetoric and a lot of anger and some confusion about the law, but if you look at those basic issues, it has guaranteed issue, it has safety net expansion, it has subsidized coverage for low-income people, and it is setting up the exchanges. So there's directionally correct elements in the law. And we didn't go to single payer in this country. We used the European model of competing health plans, guaranteed issue, and individual mandate. In most of Europe, people think that Europe looks like Canada. Europe does not look like Canada. Europe uses competing health plans. So if you go to uh, Holland, Denmark, trying to advance this, uh, Switzerland, Belgium, uh, Germany, every citizen must buy coverage, and there are private plans you can buy from. In Germany, there's 400 sickness funds. They compete with each other for the patient. The Switzerland is full of health plans. There's, there's not one single person in Switzerland with government coverage. There are quite a few low-income people with subsidized private coverage, but nobody has government coverage in Switzerland. They've achieved universal coverage by using the health plan model, but they got there by having everybody in the risk pool. Solidarity is a, is a belief in, in Europe, that, and they believe that everyone should be in the risk pool, everyone should pay their fair share, and everyone should be able to pay for their care with other people's money. I mean, it's a very basic concept, and that's the model that's actually kind of at the, at the base of the American model. We need to make sure that we get the mandate to have enough leverage so that we actually get people in. So there's issues going forward, but the, the pattern's directionally correct. Now, a point that's kind of interesting is that coverage reform and health care reform share a couple of overlapping financial realities. When you look at reforming care and reforming coverage, uh, there's a couple of realities that are very true and extremely important to both worlds. And one of those is that the cost of care is not evenly distributed. Some people think that all the care in America is evenly distributed among all the people. It's not. A small percentage of the people incur most of the care costs. So 1% of the population is about 35% of the cost of care. 
5% of the population is about 50% of the cost of care, and 10% of the population is about 80% of the cost of care. So what can we learn from that? One of the things we know is that we can intervene with that 10% and do meaningful and important things to keep them from getting over into being the 1%. Interventions, high leverage, meaningful interventions. If we think systematically, programmatically, functionally, we can identify this population and have interventions that keep it from moving into the 1% population. Mother Nature, of course, discriminates uh, on age, and so if you look at the cost of care by age, we also see much higher costs for the, the older population to multiple. But let me go back to the overlap between the risk pools and the care delivery opportunities. Um, <clears throat> if you cover everyone and then divide the total cost of care by the total number of people covered, for a basic benefit package, you can cover everyone for about $400 a month. And the reason it's 400 is because everybody's in the risk pool and everybody's paying about 80% of the people who are relatively low percentage of the cost of care are paying their premium every month. It's solidarity. That's the solidarity model. If you only enroll, and so that's a $400 premium. If you only enroll that 1%, if those are the only people who come into the risk pool, and the carrier then has to figure out a premium that will give them enough money to pay claims for that 1%, the premium jumps to $14,000. Now think about that, that's a month. So multiply that by 12, you get a bigger number. That's unaffordable. That is absolutely unaffordable. And so we need everybody in the risk pool. It's just very basic. Why do we need people in the risk pool? Because we can't afford to have just the 1% in the risk pool who are incurring most of the cost. If we get everybody in the risk pool, we get the premium down to 400 and it's affordable. So there's a huge opportunity for focus. There's a huge opportunity to do high leverage interventions. And to do that, we need to understand who those people are. And when we think about who the people are, who are the major portions, it's not who people think it is. It's not cuts, cancers, colds, and C-sections. Uh, cancers are an important part of healthcare delivery. They're not the most expensive part of healthcare delivery. The most expensive part is chronic conditions. Chronic conditions drive 75% of the cost of care, and patients with comorbidities drive 80% of the cost of care, more than one condition. So what do we know if we're thinking systematically and programmatically about making care affordable and better for America? We need to remember that um, chronic care is the primary cost driver. Chronic care is the highest leverage care improvement opportunity. I heard a debate yesterday about a particular kind of cancer care that was going to cost $100,000 per patient. And when that cancer care in total is less than 1% of the total spend in the country, the fact that it is more expensive for a very small number of patients, if you think in actuarial terms, isn't actually all that relevant. What's relevant is that diabetics consume 32% of the cost of Medicare. And that's where the opportunity is. So chronic care is the highest leverage opportunity, and chronic care is a team sport, and we can't fix chronic care or cut costs without teams. And teams are coming to us. Everybody seems to have a sense of that, and the teams are getting various names. So people are calling the teams ACOs, medical homes, nurse practitioners, care registries, integrated care. Those are all just different names for teams. The functionality, if you think in functional terms, the functionality we're trying to create is teams. Those other names are just pathways to teamness. And so we need to, if we really remember what it is we're trying to do at the core of the process, which is to create the team, then you think of the ACO as a way of getting to teamness and you think of ACOs more differently in more practical terms. If you think of ACOs as magical, something if we just call a bunch of people an ACO and they will somehow do magical things, it will fail. It'll fail utterly and completely and be a waste of money. And if we think of ACOs as being a way of focusing on the high-risk patients, high-cost patients who have comorbidities, and how do we work with those patients to make their care better, ACOs can work. So we need to have patient-focused team care. We need care to be a team sport. We also need care to be safer. We need it to be more efficient, and we need it to be more affordable. 
We need to re-engineer care at multiple levels. We need to make care safer. We need to re-engineer the process of care. At Kaiser Permanente, we looked at shift change and discovered that it was taking us as one shift would leave and the other shift would come on board and the nurses would have to sit down and talk about every patient. It was taking about 45 minutes to go through the shift change process and many information errors were happening. That was actually the time when we had the most falls for patients because the nurses would be at the end of the hall exchanging information and the patient would decide to go to the bathroom and, and have a fall. So we cut the, by re-engineering the process, we cut the shift change time down to 12 minutes and we're doing it in the patients, with the patients in the room when the patients are awake. And we've, we've cut the falls and cut the errors significantly. But it's by re-engineering care. We need to have high leverage condition focus. We need to focus on the patients with diabetes. And we need comparable, consistent, relevant data and outcomes data. And to do that, we need to set targets and then again make the right thing easy to do. If we set targets and then we say, What's the right thing for each of these patients? And we also need patients who have information, real information, so as patients make choices about where they get their care in this new world, patients understand what the sepsis death rate is in the various care sites that they're looking at. The death rate is twice as high in some settings as it is in others. The, the cabbage death rate is three and four times as high in some settings as others. Cancer survival rates are double in some settings versus others. And so we need that information in the new insurance exchanges as part of what the exchanges should be building by the time they get to 2014 and 2015 so the patients can make truly meaningful choices. And we need to set goals for the country in key areas. And if we don't have goals, then improvement will just be random and it will be unlinked and it will be functionally suboptimal. Um, <clears throat> As I say in the book, healthcare will not reform itself. So we need goals. We need half as many sepsis deaths in America. We could do that. We need survival statistics for the 10 major cancers so people can make choices based on the best care systems for their survival. We can do that. We need checklists in every surgery and emergency intervention sites so that people do systematic, programmatic care. We can do that. We need meaningful use data hooked up and focused on creating team care. And the meaningful use levers are there, they're huge, there's a lot of money attached, we can do that. So uh, let me talk about two other quick topics. One of them is cost. Cost is the hottest issue in American healthcare right now. People are most excited, most unhappy, most upset about cost. And people want both care and coverage to be affordable, which is very understandable. 